Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Chris Doyle. He's the founder and CEO of Build. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I think what you guys are doing at Build is really innovative and cool. But maybe before we get into that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Sure. Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm, a, I'm a Houston kid. Uh, okay, very cool. Grew up in a small suburb of, of Houston called uh, Conroe, Texas. Um, I went to Texas A&M. Okay. Um, you know, what, for, what did you take and why? For uh, my bachelor's degree. Well, you know, my first semester, I was a something. I think I was a civil engineering major, and I made all Ds. Okay. Um, my first semester, so I got uh, put place on scholastic probation, and they said they gently nudged me to say pick another major. Uh, so I did, and at the time I, I selected political science um, just because I thought it was interesting. So I ended up graduating with a poli sci degree and a, and a minor in economics, which I don't regret at all because it was interesting enough for me to show up to class, uh, make friends, and, and kind of enjoy the experience instead of you know worrying so much about what I wanted to be when I grew up. Interesting. No, that's that's very cool. So you get out of Texas A and M. Walk us through your career up until build and actually getting your MBA. Sure. Yeah. So I, you know, I went to a regional home builder from there. I'd been in construction prior, um, in, in like summer jobs, um, uh, framing houses. And okay. so I had some experience there, jumped into, into building houses. And this was right in the, in the residential boom when you were doing, you know, stated income, uh, mortgages for $400,000. Um, so they were built a lot of houses and that was great. But I, I think that's where it, for it, you know, the kind of entrepreneurial spirit first started really was immediately jumping into a new division that they were looking to, to launch and that exciting me. And so I, I, I reflect back on that and there's many moments throughout my career of being like the first one to say, Oh, I want to do this new thing. I want to, I want to, and it was always within a larger company. So it wasn't necessarily starting a, a company from scratch out of my garage type story, but, you know, especially to the listeners who see that same thing, like that's okay to build your, your, um, your process of how you evaluate opportunity, attack the market, um, create products within uh, under the shelter of like a larger company rather than always having to go out on your own for your like trial runs of doing this. But um, yeah, I started a home builder, worked there for about five years. I launched um, one of their new, new satellite offices in Dallas. So relocated there, um, went, went from there into commercial construction, which is a um, kind of hard to do in the construction space because the two aren't, aren't really the same in many ways. Um, okay. Done, how, how so? Uh, you know, there's so many different things. I mean, there's so much more building science applied to commercial. They're just bigger projects. The right. the process at which of how you're hiring contractors and and um, you know performing the work are totally different. Um, okay. You know, residential is a lighter lift. You know, it's not difficult to understand the building science behind things. You know, fr frame what they call stick framing is is pretty easy to understand. You know, the basic building codes, but it gets really complicated in large commercial building, um, as you can imagine, right? Imagine, uh, you know, sure. you're building a stadium, you know, it takes like a team of, of, you know, 30 just to, to put together like a structural design. Um, sure. whereas you could probably build an entire house with 30 people. Uh, yeah. that's, you know, that's where I learned so much though. I I'd worked under two owners, um, the company is Southwest construction services, it's pretty interesting to see at the time, you know, the, this like kind of partnership approach of you, ha you have your business partner and the two being totally different personalities 
and how that can work so well. Um, you know, a lot of people will ask is like, what's, what's the best advice you can give um, to a new entrepreneur? And it, to me, it's find a good business partner. And, and it's not the business partner that, you know, that you align well with, you get along with, you have similar interests, you don't fight, right? It, instead, it's like, what, where do you align? Who has the greatest strength in one part of the business? Where I, and this could be both like raw uh, kind of personality, like either being outgoing or more focused on the details, like things like that, but it, also, it can be experience-based. So if I've got 10 years in business development versus 10 years in FP&A or 10 years in, in coding and, and engineering, you know, that really matters. But you, you put two kind of introvert engineers together and start a business, there's really not a lot of value created there. You might as well just have one. Um, other than having a sounding board, there's not a whole lot there. So I, I was able, that was my first look at understanding that dynamic and just seeing how it works so well. And there sure. wasn't How a did whole you guys lot of meet? Life. Sorry to cut you off. Uh, who, who's, oh, this was um, what I'm explaining is when I, I was at another company and watching their two co-founders work oh, together. Oh, their two co-founders. Okay. Yeah. I was really just kind of observing it and going, okay. wow, you know, this one's way like this. The other one's different, you know, more reserved and calculated. And the two working together, it took both sides to really drive that business. And it was a classic, you know, bootstrap the business from the beginning you know, barely could pay the bills, had to hire people, do the work themselves most of the time. And now they're very successful subcontractor uh, in the DFW market. But, uh, you know, from, from there had done, um, jumped into the renewable energy space and had fallen. That's what, when I was getting my MBA and had really found this intersection between finance and, and, and construct, we'll call it broader construction. And that was because in the renewable energy space, the assets were very, they weren't well known and there were, the capital markets didn't fully understand them. So I helped um, kind of bridge that through a number of initiatives that would take like the way like rating agencies and the broader capital markets would view the asset, both from a physical standpoint, but also the economic standpoint. And then, and then bridge that to like the originators of the assets themselves. Um, so it jumped in from there into a consumer finance company where I was the chief commercial officer and, and had launched, um, you know, that business selling um, uh, financing for uh, solar on, on people's homes. Um, and they, um, you know, they're doing, I want to say around a billion dollars a year now. Uh, so wow. they're doing, this is dividend finance. Um, and then from there, you know, start, started Bill and that was just a couple of years ago. Okay, so how did you come up with the idea and what exactly is it? Yeah, so what we do in commercial construction, um, the supply chain finance is like extremely broken and dysfunctional. And, and what happens is a contractor, a commercial construction contractor, let's say you're an electrician, you, um, you purchase material, let's call it, you know, for a $200,000 project that might be $50,000 or so. And okay. you provide labor and that material to a commercial project. Um, then you bill for it once a month. Um, when you okay. bill for it, what happens is all the trades roll up into one uh, billing that the general contractor will then submit to the, the property owner. That process takes about 60 days on average uh, okay. because there's lots of like internal stuff that has to happen. And, sure. and it's pretty difficult. A lot of folks are trying to solve that problem through technology. But it's still the same thing. It's it's been like that for decades, and you know the fact that the the subcontractor, that electrician, had to purchase that thirty days in advance leaves this like ninety day gap between when they incur the cost versus when they're paid for the work. So right. what we do is we we provide we, we relieve that through a product that allows them to purchase the material through us, and we give them one hundred and twenty day payment terms. So it's similar to what like a quad pay and or a firm. Uh, would do in e-commerce we do for commercial construction supplies got you okay so if i'm a contractor walk us through how i actually use your platform to do that yeah it's super simple um you you basically have the supplier that you're already working with so generally when you're bidding on a project you'll get the material bid as well so you'll say hey i need um 
you know, 50 drums of this, um, you know, coding uh, for an airport job. Okay. And it's a, you know, it's a decent size order. So you get quotes probably from a couple different suppliers, even though you work with them day in, day out, you have standard pricing. It's a pretty big order. So you would, you want to make sure you get the most competitive price. Right. And so when you have that and you're ready to, to order it, you essentially just drag and drop that to our platform. Tell us when you want it paid and, and we pay the supplier on your behalf. And then oh, okay. the customer who's the sub pays us um, after 120 days or, or when they're paid, which is oftentimes sooner than, well, almost all the time, sooner than the 120 days. Okay. And so what happens if I can't make the payment after 120 days because I haven't got paid in that rare case? Yeah. And, and that's not terribly uncommon. Um, you know, we have a process that we'll, we're going to work with the contractor. It normally will involve getting more involved on the project. So we would, um, in that case, uh, likely reach out to the general contractor. So that's the one that hires all the subs okay. and confirm, you know, understand a little bit about why there is a delay, uh, but also help, you know, in many ways we can help be the stick there. You know, the general contractor hasn't been paid either. They, they don't they don't normally hold on to funds and, you know, and just sit there and make it to let the subs squirm. You know, they there's some administrative delay normally. Um, pay application got caught up somewhere. And so we help, you know, push that along. Um, and it's not it's not terribly uncommon to, to be put in that position. OK, so I'm curious, how did you basically come up with the idea and actually decide to go for it and walk us through the early days. Did you bootstrap? Did you, did you self fund? Because when you're talking tens of thousands of dollars out, out of your own pocket, when you're getting this thing kind of rolling, it's got to be kind of challenging. Yeah. You know, and this is where those that, that go the bootstrap route will, will kind of cringe because we, we just had it we really had it made. Um, we already had a relationship with a investor that um, I was working with at Dividend Finance. And so we, we kind of together identify this as an opportunity. Um, okay. you know, my background in commercial construction, and they had been more and more involved through their investment with Dividend. And so we, we really approached it together. And, and I mean, we basically got a $10 million equity check on day one. So we were put in a, a great position to just go and run and not have all the distractions of, of that initial seed funding, uh, right. which, which our growth kind of is a testament to that, right? You can see we have 400% growth, you know, first two years right out of the gate. Um, and th that's difficult to do when your, your founder is constantly, you know, worrying about, about cash and worried about, you know, where they're going to get their next round of funding from. Um, you know, we're going through our Series B right now, and I'm feeling that a lot more, where we have certainly have supportive investors, but as we've wanted to go out to the market to look at other um, folks that could, could add value other than just the capital, you know, it can be fairly taxing. I mean, as, as all the entrepreneurs, you know, listeners know, it can be fairly taxing. Um, when you're just focused on the business, it, it has a lot of advantages. Sure. But I also think it's really good advice that you were working at another company and that investor, you obviously had a good enough relationship or a very good relationship that not only was there willing to basically go into business with you, they were also willing to give you a bunch of money to start this business, right? That's right. Yeah. And, and I'm surprised that when you, when you have that close relationship, you're, you're a C level at a portfolio company. Um, you know, my, uh, advice to my team is like, take advantage of this. Right. And so it's not just our lead investor, totally. but uh, other investors on the board, like this is your opportunity to prove yourself. And when you have s some of your, like, you know, your Bessemers of the world, like some, some are just like right down the middle. They're only VC or they're only like super large, you know, hundred million dollar growth equity checks. But when you get these flexible one, I mean, Ella, our, our investor is very flexible and what they, they look at and what they can invest in, it can provide a lot of opportunity because, you know, in this case, it allowed us to start from scratch, which a lot of your more traditional VC or, or private equity would not be able to do. 
Um, but it could be that, you know, the next one could be, hey, um, you know, step into, you know, maybe it's an M&A transaction, maybe it's stepping into a larger company. You know, there's just so many opportunities when you have investors that are touching so many, you know, so many different portfolio companies. Sure. No, and it's cool that you're open to your employees basically having those relationships with your investors though too, right? You know, yeah, and I have limited experience here, so I don't know, um, you know, really what the traditional route is, but what I find is, you know, that's really my commitment to the team is to say, hey, when you come here, um, my promise isn't that we're going to guarantee success. It's not that you're going to make more money than you would otherwise, but I do guarantee one thing, and that is that this will be the best professional experience and the value you've gotten out of your professional experience, out of your career. And sometimes they go a step further and saying, we'll ever get in your career uh, because it's that exposure um, that, that is just so valuable, right? I mean, you take that, totally. that, that kind of exposure, if let's just say you're, um, you know, your um, general counsel or uh, uh, someone that has not generally worked directly with the board. And then your next venture is your own, right? Where you start your own business, having, just a little bit of experience of working with the board and understanding how investors think and, and operate and communicate just puts you so much further ahead. Because when you start from scratch, you just don't know. You really don't know how any of this stuff works. And I guess if you worked, you know, at a private equity shop or, or, or VC, it, it'd be different. But a lot of these folks, they just don't know. I mean, I was kind of one of them. I had worked with our investor, but I mean, that put me light years ahead of, of, uh, you know, just getting the lingo, making sure that you would never put a subpar product in front of them. You know, maybe it's a forecast, maybe it's a analysis of the market, right? You just know that level much, much better. Sure. Well, and you never know where you'll end up meeting again, right? Like it, it's so wild, even just like I've been in tech a couple of decades now. And it's funny how like you haven't talked to somebody or seen somebody in a decade. And then all of a sudden it's like, you're working on this project together and it's like, well, you know, not that I don't think people are, are maliciously trying to like burn bridges or whatnot, but like you never know who's going to like show up in your future. And you know, the more good relationships you can have with people, it's like, Hey man, I haven't seen you in a decade. How's it going? Right. And like, yeah, I didn't yeah. expect you to work on this project is a lot better than, Oh crap. What am I going to do? I haven't, we never had good terms. Right. Or whatever. So I think that's, <laughs> yeah. it, it happens. Yeah. Right. But so I think yeah. it's cool that you had that relationship. And I, I think that's really useful for people listening. Cause you know, sometimes in your early twenties, you think like, ah, well, it's not going to matter. It's like, it, you never know when you're like 40, if somebody like that from your early twenties just comes back. Right. You never, who knows? Um, yeah, it but, seems but, like it always matters, you know, especially the early days, like so totally. much matters at that point. You're setting your your reputation, you know, out there. And, and you might be an inexperienced kid, right, that makes mistakes. Sure. Yeah. Right? And that's fine. And that's perfectly fine. Right? Almost everyone is at that age. But if you're not if you're not driven and you're not committed and, and you know, I hate using the integrity card, high integrity. But I think the drive is is the big key. Like if people if you're known as like you know, with a really high drive, it's like, sometimes you just have this, Hey, this person isn't the right fit for us now, but man, they're going to be something I guarantee. Uh, totally. And having that kind of reputation is, is just as good. Oh, hundred percent. So if you're a supplier, how can people get on your platform and actually start using the service for their contractors and others that they're providing the materials for? Yeah, so for contractors, it, it's very easy. You you go to our website, build.com, B-I-L-L-D.com, um, and you you enroll through our process. It's very it takes you know less than five minutes, and you really then are put in a position where you can start immediately uh, okay. by by putting in your quote. Now for a supplier, right? We're we're solving a lot of problems for them too. We're paying them up front for material sure. they normally would provide you know, like 30 day terms to their customers. In this case, we're paying them up front, which oftentimes the, the our customer will get a, a discount. Well, more times than not, they'll get a discount, you know, cash discount basically, right? Because you're paying an advance. Right. So, but because we solve a lot of problems with them, we've had a tremendous um, level of interest of suppliers that want to work directly with us. They, they get on our platform as well. 
and then they offer the product directly to their customers. So right. customers that, you know, m maybe are always like butting up against their credit line. M maybe they're growing, the, the contractor is growing so fast that you, you can never quite get your credit line right, you know, because you're saying, well, look, if you sure. did 5 million in revenue, why do you need a million for a month, right? Because that, that wouldn't make sense. Right. But when you're growing really fast, that, that's why you would need it. Um, so th we, we're often used as a, as a resource in that way as well, directly uh, by a supplier. And, and that's like huge, like, you know, like a Sherman Williams of the world, a Ferguson, which is a big plumbing supplier, global plumbing su uh, supplier. You know, th these kinds of folks are on our platforms too. Very cool. So how do you guys monetize the platform by lending this money for you know, 120 days? Yeah, so our model, because we, we're relatively new, uh, we're still proving out a lot of the risk. So we, we actually take the risk ourselves. So okay. we didn't just go raise 10 million in equity. We also have a $50 million dollar warehouse line um that allows us to draw on that um okay. and and that's effectively our our lending um uh cash so if uh, just to walk through the economics here if we do a ten thousand dollar purchase we would draw ten thousand dollars on our line which we pay a, a percentage um, of interest on that line okay. then we're 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 financing our contractor so we charge them um, definitely at least our cost, of course, and then on top of that, right? Okay. So in many ways, the debt capital, the 50 million is our inventory. So we, we buy it, we have an arranged agreement to, to access it, we pay for it, and then we sell it at a higher price. Um, gotcha. So we, okay. we had done that fairly early and the, the destination, um, the lending space can be tough and to get like the the really high multiples you really don't want like true balance sheet risk um that that you really want to flow to a bank because they're gonna have the lowest cost um of funds deposit sure. of, uh cost of funds and um this is their core business is lending um so ideally in, in over the long term you have a bank that essentially takes this on but we're in the like early frontier days of what we're doing. Um, you know, we're doing small business lending unlike any other players, players out there, at least in the construction vertical, because of our very untraditional approach to underwriting. We're doing all the normal stuff that any other lender would do, <clears throat> you know, pulling their experience business reports, you know, all your anti-fraud stuff, you know, verifying annual revenue, but you know, we don't get into a, a super deep dive on the financial statements. Why? Because we know what their problem is. We know they have low cash balances, right? And why? Right. Because the payment cycle's broken. So what's the use of us just sitting here and going, no, we, we only want people with, you know, 15%, you know, debt to income ratio, right? It's like, we want, we, we understand our customer and embrace it. And we use other underwriting um, processes, techniques to evaluate the customer for what is truly the risk within our segment. Um, and, and it's not like banks can't do this. They really need to know. And we have that institutional knowledge of construction and how all the relationships work and what are the levers to pull and what to look at for to truly understand what makes a contractor successful or not. And that's what makes us different in what we do. And when you go back to the debt side, you need some, I can't just say that to raise, to raise debt. I can't just say, oh, I know the industry, we'll do it this way. They want to see the performance. And so we're, you know, we're in like the fifth or sixth vintage now of, of our cycle of, of um, because we have 120 days, so we flip it. And right. w once you get that data, you're really po much better positioned to show, hey, look, we've done it 10 times over, 10 cycles now with the same performance metric. That's when banks start to you know, raise their eyebrow and say, okay, we're interested. Got you. Okay, interesting. So do you have any advice about raising and lending and actually getting 
this set up because it this is very new and I think a lot more companies are going to probably spring up that do this inside of other verticals. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, if you, so if you're starting from scratch, it's a, it's a challenge, right? There's a barrier to entry here because sure. not only do you have to operate the business, stand up some kind of platform, right? It could be small, but some kind of platform that hosts your data, your, your customer information, you're able to underwrite your customer, right? You're able to process a, your very first deal, but then you also have to have the capital to fund the deal. So, right. you know, you, my advice on something like this to start with is to go find pro probably more of like, you know, high wealth angel investor uh, type that says, hey, you're going to make two investments. One's going to be in the equity of our business. The other is going to be in an asset. And then you define the asset as, as your, um, what you're lending against. And you can pay out the, the, um, on, the, on the asset financing um, as much as you're you're bringing in, you could pay out, have a negative carry. You could pay even more. In other words, my fee on the facility or on asset capital could be you know, 15, 20%, even though I may only be char charging the customer that much and, and even have a negative carry. Because right. what you're trying to do, most important thing is not making a, that 3% profit, you know, that delta. The most important thing is you want to prove out your model. So you give them all those early returns and say, hey, you're going to get the whole thing, right? You're going to get, if you're lending at 15%, I'll give you the, all, the whole 15%, right? So they get that early juice, so to speak. And then once you have the data, right, that becomes very valuable to go level up to that next lower cost uh, source of capital. And then the finish line is when you're working with a bank or a credit union, right? That's, the, that's gotcha. providing, you know, cost of, debt at like, you know, three and a half percent, right? It's just really, really low cost, but you can't start out that way. Interesting. No, I, I think that's actually really good advice. And even just your advice about getting data, right? To validate your, like, I get you can skew data how you want, but at the end of the day, if you truly, you can present it in a way that is unbiased and you can prove that what you're doing is working. And you can also prove that, look, we did it like this. If we do it like this, we can save X here, here, and here and, and keep kind of using the data to refine your model. Is, is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what you're really doing is you're saying that you're, you're communicating to your next uh, debt provider that here's how we underwrite and we've created a predictive process now that right. we, we've predicted what the losses will be and they'll be x so whether losses will be you know 30 basis points or you know 20 percent annually that it doesn't really matter as long as it's predictable because why it doesn't matter is you just build it into your cost but if you've only right. gone through full term a couple of times it's not enough to really prove out that that's what's going to happen when you multiply that by 100 meaning you, you go from lending a million dollars to a hundred million dollars, a lot more at stake, right? right. So the, the idea is that you have enough data to support when it scales that you'll have the same loss rates. Got you. Interesting. That That's actually really quite fascinating. So I'm curious, where do you see the space going? Because, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that there's like a, shortage on lumber right now so it's really expensive it, and i'm assuming other materials are like that i know there's like a chip shortage there's a bunch of shortage in a bunch of industries right now does that really affect you guys or or how has that changed or stayed the same from what you guys are doing and, and actually for your contractors and your suppliers yeah we're, we're still learning how it affects us now but it's very real um i mean it's it's becoming a major issue in the construction space right now. Sure. Um, and, you know, not just on getting the job done, but when, you know, lumber triples its price and, you know, and I don't even know, I'm not following like index or anything of what, what it's actually done. But if that price increases based on a bid you put together months ago, or even as far as a year ago, sure. You know, you have to rebid everything, you know, because there's no way for a contractor to, 
to eat that that um, that price change in in the and the material. So what the trends we're seeing right now are, are that um, our customers are wanting to to secure what is available. So more advanced um, purchasing, um, larger okay. bulk purchasing. But um, so, you know, for example, if you're about to start a decent sized multifamily product project, which is predominantly lumber uh, a frame, then you know, that that's like super unclear right now what the final, you know, when you're ready to start and buy it, what the pricing will actually be. But if you are looking to start in two months, it would behoove you to go ahead and pay now, get it, get it secured. It's not just the pricing, but it's the availability too, right? Because then if no matter what the pricing, if it's doubled in a month, if it's not available, then you're, you know, whether you get an additional price consideration or not, you know, you can't perform your, you can't perform the work. I mean, you can't generate revenue. Sure. Well, and then the more a project's delayed, the more money it's costing you, right? So like there's way more factors than just lumber doubling or tripling or whatever the price is, right? Yeah. And it's, there's definitely a stage of uncertainty. I think with contractors across, across the board right now, they don't even know what, what they have to worry about, what products are going to face supply shortages um, what products are going to face significant price increases because it's not all perfect supply and demand economics. It's not that supply shortages immediately trigger a price increase. You know, some right. things are just not priced that way. Um, and there's, there's other options and things like that, but it, it has been a, it, it's caused a lot of uncertainty for our customers because they don't even know which one to worry about. And all, all the while they're just very busy so it's like they can't even look at the problem square in the eye just yet. Interesting. Is there any way you could help with that or that's not really what you guys do because you don't really collect that data? Um, no, I mean, some of the stuff is a little easier. Like lumber is, you know, there's there's indexes out there. There's um, There's enough of it in the market to understand the availability and, and and the current pricing and what expected future pricing i mean you can buy lumber at home depot right so it's a, it's a right. retail product there's plenty i wouldn't say there's plenty of availability but it's a lot more right down the middle i think the issues come up with things like i mentioned earlier like a specialty coating like you don't right. even know that it's a it's something that it is going to be a supply chain issue until you go to order it right for the first time and it could be you know it could be pandemic uh issues it could be the the canal issue tobacco right Right. that folks are still recovering from right it it could be a lot of reasons but you know I, i would i would say the best thing you can do as a contractor is really go out and look at the things that you're procuring and and tap your supplier and say should i be concerned about these things and if i should be what what should i do you absolutely should be using your supplier as a as a at, as a um, um, resource through this process because they they also want you to if they can't help you get it or they know the price is going to increase it makes sense for them to communicate that now but if you're not talking to them you know they they they've got their own issues right now to deal with so if you're sure. not forcing the conversation you know they they likely won't bring it up got you okay. So you guys have obviously built some software around this, at least to collect data. What advice do you give to others that are looking to get in this space or others, whether they're technical or maybe not technical? Because, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think a lot of people in the construction industry can kind of be either really technical, not technical at all, or, or maybe somewhere in between. Yeah. No, I think there's, there's a broad um, pivot point and it doesn't, as a technology company, when you first start that you decide you have to make a decision on. And that is, do I build this from complete scratch or do I use products that can help stand it up and be sure. the bones of the application uh, from a data or an application process standpoint? Um, one being that, so if you, if you do the pros and cons, standing up on bones that already exist like for example do you use like a salesforce crm to be your your back end or do you build that out through your own data library right and so the the pros is you can start immediately right 
But the con is that maybe it's not as scalable. It's not as customizable. Um, it, um, you know, you're going to have to go through the, co the cost of replacing it anyway. And I would say the only, you know, advice I would say is like, where, where does your skill set lie? Because there's such an advantage to owning the back end on, on your own, not being reliant to anything other than like who hosts it, like an AWS kind of platform. But the actual data by, uh, database, the all the the workflow, your application layer, everything being built and owned by by your company, there's so much flexibility and value in that for in the capital markets, right? In the right in the value of your business. If you have a technology background, I mean, it just makes sense to go down that route because even though it may be more painful, you may have built be building it two or three times because you don't have product market fit, so you may be shifting quickly. Right, but you know, the advantage of having that and owning it up front is it, just, is is so much better. Now, if you don't have that, um, that background, then, you know, the cost of bringing in, you know, a, a, an engineer or a, um, I mean, because it's more than an engineer, right? You need a, a full team to develop yeah. this kind of stuff. And, you know, that, that can really hinder your growth because like, that's it's not your sweat equity. You're having to pay someone to do it. And these folks, you know, unless they're a co-founder that has tremendous upside in the business, they won't come cheap. Yeah, um, so I think that's probably an element of, you know, your decision making and, you know, what, what your own background is. No, I, I think that's actually really good advice. Is there any other advice that you would give to people that you maybe wish you knew early on in your career that you, you do now, or, or maybe some stuff that, um, held you back from actually maybe starting uh, build or, or any other advice you'd give to people or that you see all the time that you wish people would maybe stop doing? Yeah. I mean, I think the co-founder, your, your business partner is a big, is a big decision. And, and before you've pulled the trigger or even maybe even after you've pulled the trigger on starting a business, you know, aside from being a, the kind of perfect fit for you professionally, you know, the sounding board and, and the daily, um, I'd saw it, I call it like a challenge of having someone else there with you. Um, it is just super helpful. I mean, it's more than helpful. I can't, I can't overstate this enough. It, it's, it's really everything. And I've, I've kind of done it both ways. I've started a business on my own, um, and, and done fairly well with it. And, and it, you know, going through the customer acquisition challenges and, you know, customer churn and what, what product features. And while there's a lot of um, benefits to having full control, um, you know, even lifestyle benefits, right? So if I decide to throttle that business hard and really commit a lot to it, you know, I can. And if I decide not to and just just kind of focus maybe even on another business, you could do that. But the, okay. the advantage of having a, a business partner who's equally aligned with you in the business really helps that, that daily um, kind of get you up and drive the business kind of attitude, plus the sounding board piece. And I'm really referring to the early days. Once you have a full team around you, it's a lot, it's a lot different um, sure. because you're getting that from employees. But in the early days, you don't, you don't really have that. So um, I, I would say go find a good business partner. And if you're in your, like me, I was in you know the workplace for 15 years before I had started something, maybe not that long, but consider that whole time your your like pursuit to find a business partner right and, sure. and you're looking for someone that you can trust right that that works well with you and and that has the same kind of initiatives to, to, to start a business and a cool interesting uh, uh, idea sure so how did you meet your co-founder oh uh, we worked together at the last uh, last okay. company okay. yeah so it's it kind of an easy one uh, but you know over 10 or 15 years, I can, I can kind of pluck out people that I, I could just call and say, Hey, I'm thinking of this idea. Let's, let's meet for lunch, talk, nurture that into, um, you know, I probably have a roster in my head of, you know, five to seven people that I would be great to start a business with. Sure. No, that that's great. The other thing you mentioned, um, is getting that feedback from your employees, how have you, as a CEO and co-founder of a company, actually nurtured that culture where employees feel comfortable enough to bring you 
good ideas or maybe say, you know what, like that might be a good idea to you, but it's not because of this, this, and this, or how, how have you nurtured that? You know, with us, it's been it's been tough um, because ideas. Um, you know, everyone has ideas, and a lot of your first, a lot of your first couple of years is just got to be focused on product market fit. Okay. So there's the there's the you know tweaking your product and getting the like exact fit, and how do we have to change this to overcome this obstacle, and how do we increase this conversion? Right to get it dialed into the point where you can go raise capital and really grow it. So a lot of like the idea component, you know, at least with us, we're fairly disciplined about shutting a lot of that down. Um, okay. The the I think the um, to answer the question though, it's more around like how do you get the feedback to improve your products, not so much like brand new ideas of the, let's let's launch this to market because a lot of companies that you know they fall victim of that. They're like so totally. idea driven that's like well, what what's your product guys like what are you doing yeah. you just um, chase your tail right yeah and you know i don't yeah. i don't really know i think m my advice is like to to be a little bit in listen mode both from a ceo perspective but also from the team perspective and both sides really shouldn't be so quick to say well this is it this is it this is it is allow a discovery process and you know if you're di i mean we did it this morning we have a kind of a problem statement right now. And it's like, everyone's a little bit in listen mode. And it's like, well, let's understand this. Like, so you're really, you're not solving the problem immediately. You're, you're really breaking it down, understanding it better, you know, talking about it, discussing it. Then, then it's like, okay, I think we've, you know, we've, we go, th go through some data to look through, you know, are the things we, we think anecdotally we're coming up with correct. And then, um, and then go into more of a solve mode. So, I do think, especially inexperienced folks, that sometimes they they feel they come in pretty hot on, oh, you should do this. It's like, well, no one really knows. It's not even, that's not even the CEO, the investors, the team. No one really can just off gut go, oh, here's the solution. Sure. So more 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 be in listen mode of you know how to unravel the problem, and um, and be kind of a more of a patient approach to it would would be my advice. No, I actually think that is really good advice. I feel. Like so many times, and I've caught myself doing this too, is like you get so reactionary that you end up like you don't really try out an idea because you ne fully because you never really figured out what the real problem was that you were trying to solve. And you end up chasing your tail for weeks or months and you keep trying to hit this like moving target that chances are you're never going to hit. But you got to like step back and just say, okay, like what are we really trying to solve here? What do we know? What do we not know? What do we need to find out to make sure that what we're trying to solve for is actually the real problem. Right. And I think yeah, that's actually yeah. really good advice. Yeah. I mean, I think the other um, piece and is, you know, the competitiveness of your, of your peers and your ability to get along with other functional leaders in the business, you know, our, our, um, our company now is pretty small, right? 50 people, but we have a, a senior, you know, an executive team of four, and then a, a broader leadership team of, of about nine. And, okay. you know, anyone can be a really good sales manager. Not anyone, but there are a lot of really good sales managers. There's a lot of really good, in, you know, uh, call it uh, engineering leads, um, you know, product, legal, right? That, but your ability to connect and fully understand other functional areas of the business and not have this, like, huge ego that says, you know, hey, I've been in this for 20 years. I know best and I know about your business and really try to create not, I wouldn't say conflict free because you do want some friction there for both party, both kind of functional sides to be, to be better. But your ability to enable the other functional areas of the business, that's, that's your real value, right? And so it's, it's your classic, like in our case, credit versus sales, right? Sure. Uh, Interesting. The folks that run sales and their ability to, mitigate risk right they're more valuable to us as salespeople than those that just sell a lot right that, that just yeah, sell more and, and, and always need a guardian to kind of hold hold their credit risk right um right. and, and it, when you're in it's one thing to be early stage in your career where your only job is getting a hold of someone and converting a transactional sale it's another thing to be 
more of a leader in a leadership role where all this stuff really matters to the equity value of the business, right? Sure. So it's, it's more than just that sale, right? Is this truly help the business um, grow and, and, and create value? No, I, I think that's actually really good advice, but we're out of time. And so how about we close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself and, and build in any other links you want to mention? Cool. Yeah, no, really just our website, build.com, B-I-L-L-D.com. Um, and, you know, that, that has all of our contact information. Of course, a very easy process to get enrolled. Perfect, Chris. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day. Same to you, Kevin. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com.